All right. Um, so we're at 1.30. I think we'll, we'll kick it off right at the top um, just to go through some orientation of how, how we expect the session to go. So hello, everybody, and welcome to the um, session on recent advancements in marine data management from omics to imaging and beyond. Uh, my name is Matthew Biddle, and I'm with the NOAA's uh, Integrated Ocean Observing System Office. And um, today we'll be going over a couple, um, a couple really interesting um, recent uh, activity in marine data management world. And the, 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 the goals of this session was to really highlight some new activities, highlight some ongoing activities, and try to foster collaboration across the uh, heterogeneous disciplines within oceanography. And so this is a, a, a cross collaboration between the marine data cluster and the uh, biological data standards cluster here at ESIP. Um, and so first and foremost, we'll be using uh, the notes document that's available through Kiko chat. Uh, if you could hop on there, sign in, um, put name and affiliation and that kind of information, that would be great. Um, we do have a note section within that document. So feel free to, to hop in. There's uh, hyperlinks within the documents to go down to each section where we have uh, notes and then any, um, any additional kind of takeaways that, that that you you get from the presentations, um, and I'd like to have a reminder of the community participation guidelines. Uh, that by participating in this session, you agree and adhere to the ESIP community participation guidelines. And if you do have any issues, to please uh, take a look at that link and and uh, communicate them up through the chain. Um, I would like to take a moment to recognize the tribal lands from which I am presenting to you today, the Susquehannock, uh, Piscataway, and Nantango, or the Nanticoke. I am presenting from Annapolis, Maryland. Um, and, uh, and I already went over the goals of the session. So to kick it off, I'd like to go over a brief introduction of the marine data cluster and the biological data standards clusters. So if, um, if everybody's seeing my screen, Abby, if you don't mind taking it away, go from there. Okay, great, thanks. Um, yeah, so my name's Abby Benson. I work for the US Geological Survey and I'm the lead for the uh, biological data standards cluster. My co-leads are Diana Lesnella Grunwald, who's here today and gonna be presenting later on eDNA, Robert McGuinn and Aaron Satterwey. So um, do you wanna move to the next slide for me, Matt? Our goal for the cluster is to maximize data relevance and utility for understanding changes in biodiversity over time. And so this cluster kind of kicked off after a workshop on biological data standards hosted by IUS and ESIP. And since then, we've um, been meeting for about a year and a half and uh, produced a primer. And I'll, I'll link to the primer in the chat once I'm done speaking. Um, so just trying to spread awareness about biological data standards that are available. And so I think uh, with that, I'll just end there. Um, oh, the, uh, sorry, one other thing. We meet Thursdays, uh, the, the first Thursday of the month at 1400 Eastern, if you'd like to join us. And so I'll put a link to our wiki also. Thanks. Right. And, um... I'll talk a little bit about the marine data cluster. My name is Chris Olson. I'm a data manager at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, and I am one of the co-chairs of the marine data cluster along with Matt and Carolina. Um, we meet the last Thursday of every month at 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, 11 a.m. Pacific. Um, if you go to the next slide, Matt. So, um, this is a this is sort of an overview of our goals of the marine data cluster. Um, in general, we view it as a platform for people to share what's going on in the marine data community, how they're solving problems, and also as a as a place for people to uh, collaborate and um, work on things together and find partnerships. Because a lot of us are working on the same problems, and we find that sharing what we're doing is really helpful and tackling those problems. You go to the next slide, Matt. 
So this is just a slide of some examples of some of the topics that we address. In general, we like to have one sort of ongoing topic that we're addressing. For example, um, in the past year, we've spent a lot of time working on controlled vocabulary selection, um, as well as implementation for people working within the marine data community, trying to navigate the world of controlled vocabularies is a common problem that we all face. Um, but it, it's also, we also have topics that sort of just come up out of interest. Um, we hear about something going on within the community, someone builds a new portal, or it's just something that we want to know more about, and we ask someone to present and have a discussion on that. So again, if you're interested, um, we meet the last Thursday of the month at 2 p.m. Eastern, and uh, more information can be found on the ESIP wiki. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Abby. Uh, so our first presenter is Diana Lascala Greenwald, who from uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and she will be presenting on omics and um, Darwin Core. So. Thanks, Matt. Let me pull up my slides here. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Are you guys seeing that? Awesome. Looks great. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Um, so as Matt said, my name is Diana Lascala Grunwald. I am a data scientist at the Central Northern California Ocean Observing System, CENCUS, which is housed at Ambari. Um, and I'm also here as a data manager for the Central, Central California MBON, which is the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network. Um, so this work was kind of in affiliation with that. Um, yeah, and I'm excited to talk a little bit to you guys about environmental DNA or eDNA and how recent advancements have enabled us to start to use it to fuel global biodiversity research. So as we all know, we live in a time where we're facing a lot of critical questions in marine science, and a lot of those questions are centered around the diversity of life. For example, we want to understand how organisms are shifting their spatial distributions in response to climate change and how those shifts might affect our environments and ecosystems. Fundamentally, we could argue, uh, these research questions are fueled by a basic kind of data. It's the observation of a particular organism in a particular place at a particular time. And this is also known as occurrence data. And historically, these data have been gathered by all sorts of systems, scuba divers, ROVs, ships, et cetera. Um, but recently, there's a number of new approaches that are emerging. And one of those is DNA metabarcoding. So DNA metabarcoding is a technique that relies on the fact that we all leave behind genetic traces of ourselves in our environment. So the classic example that everyone thinks of is like the eyelash or the splash of blood at a crime scene. But in a very similar way, marine organisms actually leave behind traces of themselves in seawater as well. So DNA metabarcoding allows you to collect a sample from the environment, such as seawater, and actually sequence all of the DNA it contains to determine which organisms were in a particular place at a particular time. And this DNA is referred to as environmental DNA or eDNA. So increasingly, eDNA is being used to complement other traditional monitoring methods, and it really has the potential to greatly increase the amount of occurrence data we have globally. Um, so we really want to make sure we're prepared to integrate and share that new data type. Um, so today, I want to talk a little bit about recent work that's letting us contribute DNA-based observations to global biodiversity platforms, such as the Ocean Biodiversity Information System, OBIS, and the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, GBIF. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how eDNA-based occurrences differ from other kinds of occurrence data, and how the new DNA-derived data extension to Darwin Core accommodates those differences. And to make that conversation a little bit more concrete, I'm gonna focus in on a particular data set that I worked on last year. Uh, which is the 18S Monterey Bay Time Series, uh, which is an eDNA data set generated by Francisco Chavez and Kathleen Pitts, both researchers at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. So the Monterey Bay Time Series is an ongoing program where measurements are taken monthly at three different stations in the Monterey Bay, which is along the central coast of California. Um, filtered seawater began being collected for other purposes and frozen in the mid-2000s. 
but water has been collected specifically for eDNA research beginning in the mid-2010s. And the samples related to the data that I've been working with are from filtered seawater samples from a single station, which you can kind of see here at the mouth of Monterey Bay Canyon. So as I said at the beginning, with funding from MBON and in collaboration with Sencus, researchers at Imbari have been sequencing the eDNA inside these water samples. So the data I have been working with consists of a small subset of 60 water samples, which were collected in 2006 and between 2013 and 2016. And they went DNA metabarcoding uh, in the 18S E9 region, which targets primarily phytoplankton. And the resulting sequences went through this extensive bioinformatics pipeline. And so that involves quality checking, identifying unique sequences, which are called amplicon sequence variants or ASVs. And you can kind of think about them as species proxies. Um, and then finally assigning taxonomy to each ASV using a genetic reference database. So the resulting data is organized into three tables. The first is a metadata table, which contains information on the collection, extraction, amplification, and sequencing of these samples. The second table is an ASV table, which contains the actual DNA sequence of the ASV or species proxy, as well as the number of times this sequence was observed in the water sample, which is referred to as the number of reads. And finally, there's a taxonomy table that matches each of those ASV sequences to taxonomy kingdom through species. So in my little imagined ASV sequence here, maybe that matches up with blue rockfish. So you might already be noticing, you know, some ways that eDNA data differs from other kinds of occurrence data. A really big component of this is all the new metadata that needs to be captured in order for the data set to be interpretable. So we need to know about field sampling, when, where, and how the, or the sample was collected. We need to know more about wet lab procedures, such as the extraction method and the amplification protocol. We need to know about sequencing, which biomarker was targeted, which primers were used, whether or not the raw sequences are archived anywhere online. And we know, need to know about that bioinformatics pipeline. So what cleaning procedures were used, what taxonomic reference database was used, those kinds of things. Another difference is that species identification is a little bit complicated or more different uh, in eDNA research. So instead of just you know, seeing a fish in the ocean, you're matching a DNA sequence to a species name using a database. And so this procedure evolves through time and it also can vary between research groups. And so identifications can vary um, based on those factors. And then finally, it's a little unclear how these data can be combined with other kinds of occurrence data in a scientifically rigorous way. So recent work has really focused in on this first issue, which is maybe a little more tractable than some of the others. Um, so in order to capture all of these new kinds of metadata, a new Darwin core extension has been developed. So I don't know if everyone in this audience is familiar with Darwin core, but just in case, um, Darwin Core is a glossary of terms, which is intended to facil facilitate the sharing of information about biological diversity. So functionally, you can kind of think about it as a prescribed set of tables with specified column names and sometimes specified column content. Tables in a Darwin Core archive can include an event table, which contains information about the sampling event during which an organism was observed, and an occurrence table, which contains information about the organism itself. There are also a number of extensions to Darwin Core. So for example, the measure matter fact extension allows for a third table where you can include ancillary measurements related to the sampling or the organism that's served. So now a DNA-derived data extension has been created. And this vastly expands the amount of information that can be communicated through the data while still complying with the standard. And it enables biodiversity platforms like OBIS and GBIF to integrate these new data types into their systems. So late last year, I used the extension to publish the first eDNA data set on OBIS and GBIF. And you guys should have access to my slides, so you should be able to check out those data sets. Um, they're linked in the slide. This experience was relatively painless, uh, thanks to a recently published GBIF guide to publishing DNA-derived data through biodiversity data platforms. And you guys can also check that out. Um, but there were, of course, you know, a few challenges. One was around DNA medic barcoding science and procedures. 
For those of us who are not super familiar with this particular set of practices, there's definitely a learning curve. Um, and I think the best thing we can probably do there is start to build a community of practice around these um, managing this type of data. A larger problem was related to taxonomy. So super, super briefly, taxonomic names that are approved by a taxonomic authority, such as the World Register of Marine Species, don't always match up with the, those that you might obtain from a genetic reference database. And this is a challenge that the community is dealing with and is gonna have to continue to work on moving forward. So if you wanna know a lot more details about the conversion process, I encourage you to visit my use case on GitHub. So it's linked here at the bottom of the slide. And there you'll be able to look at my code and actually run it using Binder. Um, hopefully help me improve it too. Okay, so just to wrap up, the ability to contribute DNA-derived data to global biodiversity platforms has the ability to be really impactful for biodiversity research and help us address some really important scientific questions. And as a small example of this impact, the addition of this test data set that I worked with increased the number of observations in OBIS along the US West Coast by 3%. And so this is an area I hope we can continue to work on and improve on as scientists and data managers in the future. Um, I'd like to thank a number of people who have been super instrumental to all of this. Um, and thanks to you guys for listening. Awesome. Thank you so much, Diana. That was amazing. Um, so I, I forgot to mention, so we'll be doing um, <laughs> quick presentations and then uh, open it up for one or two questions. And then we'll go into the next presentation. And at the end of the session, we'll have um, about 30 minutes for open discussion um, for anything like that. So I do see one question, Diana, in the chat from uh, Rob Casey about drift of eDNA due to water currents and predator carry and deposit figure into meta barcoding analysis. And that was actually a question that I had too. Yeah, I mean, that's a fantastic question. And I had initially included something about that on the slides, but it was a little too much to fit into a super short presentation. Um, I don't think currently that they're accounting for that in the actual analysis. I think work has been done to see, you know, to what extent that is playing a role in whether or not DNA is detected at a particular location. Um, but I'm not an expert on that particular area and I would love to know more myself. Um, I think it's still a pretty active area of investigation. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate it, Diana. Um, so we'll move on to the next presentation uh, from Stace Beaulieu at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute on uh, plankton imaging. So take it away, Stace. Hi. Hi, I too will try to share slides. Let's see if this works. Oops, not that one. Slideshow. Share screen. Um, Let's see if this works. Hi, let me know if you're seeing my slide. Looks good. Oh, great, thank you, Matt. Hi, I'm Stace Beaulieu, and I'm talking with you today from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Massachusetts. And I'm here to highlight a new data model uh, developed by a working group to um, accommodate and publish data from for, for plankton and particles from imaging. And I'm gonna try my best to relate back to Diana's talk because plankton imaging is another approach to obtaining occurrence data. And some of what I'll show you today is very analogous to the steps that Diana showed. So first of all, I hope you all have access to my slides so that you can actually go in and click on the link here at the top and you can go into what's called here, this is a dashboard for an imaging flow cytobot. And this particular dashboard is um, for, uh, this is an underwater microscope that is deployed on a mooring off San Diego, California. And you can go in and explore the images for the organisms and the, detritus and everything else in the water. By the way, think of this the next time you're out swimming in the ocean, all these microscopic things you're swimming amongst. In any case, this is to show you that images like these are coming in in, in near real time in many locations around the world. And then here in the next slide, you can access a dashboard for a very large data set. And this is a, 
a data set um, collected by the Northeast Fishery Science Center using an imaging flow cytobot in a project that I'm involved with for the LTER program. And in this case, I'm showing you the broad spatial scale over which such images may be collected. In this case, if you look at the top of the dashboard, if you're, if you're playing around, you'll see, um, I think this morning there was about 36 million images in this particular data set. So if we look at, let's look at two particular regions of interest. Um, these two images I'm gonna just have us take a little look at. Uh, what do we wanna know about these images? We probably wanna know who are these? Who are these plankton? What types of organisms are we looking at? How would we classify? How would we give these a name, right? And then we might wanna know what sizes are being represented here. Um, What's a length representation, a width or a volume representation? So um, the goal of my talk today, if there's one takeaway, is um, we had a working group sponsored by the Ocean Carbon and Biogeochemistry Office. This is a um, pretty international working group that just published a best practices document. If you look in the Ocean Best Practices Repository, you can find this document. And I'm gonna just step through some of the key aspects of this data model. Okay, so back to those two uh, images that we were looking at before. We wanted to know what types and sizes of, of plankton are we looking at. And because this is ESIP, I actually gave you a snippet of, of, the, of a table, right? <laughs> data table. And I'm actually going to build on this data table for you. Um, what you're seeing here in this very small table excerpt is you're seeing two, uh, two labels, names. These are labels that were um, matched to um, an automated classification software system, right? So um, in this case, uh, automated routine has determined the name for these two organisms. And different software, imaging processing software has been applied to determine a couple of different size metrics. Um, maybe you've never heard of a ferret diameter, for example, that's like a caliper diameter, um, major minor axis as if these organisms could be represented by an ellipse. So in true ESIP fashion, I'm just giving you an, like just an overview of what is in this table. This data model is a tabular data format. It provides a number of columns across. Some of the columns relate to type. Some of the columns relate to size. Um, we have, we are, um, it's kind of wide format. Someone like Diana might be interested in that, right? Like we're providing both an automated name and a, in this case, a human provides a manual annotation name and we match the name to a taxonomic reference database. So this is similar in Diana's talk where a taxonomic authority provides a, a name and an identifier um, within the, the hierarchy of kingdom all the way to species. And for sizes uh, from the previous slide, I could populate three of the types of sizes that this data model presently accommodates. So we had an environmental data initiative fellow, Kathy Chi, who helped us conceptualize the workflow for populating this data model. And the point I want to get across is that to provide types and sizes for these types of data, and to provide the geographic um, context for the occurrence, it requires a lot of sources of data. So here, um, this workflow pulls data actually from the IFCB dashboards that you're playing with to get automated labels, to get size data, to get uh, the geographic position and time, for example. But we also have um, lab groups have manual annotations, uh, their own databases to label when they have humans identifying the, the organisms in the picture. And the taxonomic reference databases are also online and need to be um, put into the workflow to make this tabular output. So back to Diana's talk, Diana mentioned all the new metadata that are needed to understand um, what goes into the, the, the table at the end. So the types of metadata we're talking about here and the provenance that's important is everything from the starting with the instrument. And so we start at the top here, we have a plankton imaging instrument. What are the settings for the instrument that affect the types and sizes? Then um, we mentioned sizes. What are the image processing uh, methods used to determine the sizes? I mentioned automatic or automated classification. 
what types of machine learning algorithms were used, what version, and then finally, what was the interpretation that allowed us to apply a label? So the very first data package using this model has been published in the Environmental Data Initiative Repository. And um, to relate again, back to Diana's talk, um, we used, um, in this case, the, the table and the metadata to extend the table to include the geographic context to align better with Darwin Core. And there's a number of other fields that Diana didn't have to get into either, which allows you to meet the minimum requirements for the Ocean Biodiversity Information System. So EDI is one repository, but there are others. So NASA CBAS repository, actually some of the members of the OCB working group are involved with NASA CBAS. And so if you go into the CBAS repository, you can today click on plankton imagery and access a number of data files that have been contributed in the past year. And I'm highlighting here one data set. This is the NASA exports program. And I went into a dashboard and pulled out one particular image. I pulled out this image because, I mean, Yes, it has a shape and everything, but I just didn't think that was an organism, right? So I, I thought it was going to be detritus. And sure enough, I was able to um, look for that identifier through the dashboard. I found the auto class, the auto class is given as detritus clear. Okay, that cannot match to anything in a taxonomy database, right? So the CBAS repository actually provides a vocabulary today. I provide the link here to a number of these um, non-organism types that we find uh, in marine snow. Also, uh, the NSF-funded BicoDemo repository was involved in the OCB working group. And if you go today into the BicoDemo um, resources, you'll be able to click on a number of different types of plankton imaging systems. And you'll see there's just more and more data being submitted for these types of instruments. Um, so some of the recent developments include the fact that BicoDemo matches its parameters to controlled vocabularies. So um, extending upon the work that we did in the working group, now some of those size parameters are being better matched to controlled vocabularies. This example that I'm showing is um, actually in GitHub and it's involving developers of the EcoTaxa dashboard and how um, there's essentially international uh, work going on on how to better match the size metrics to controlled vocabularies. So I do want to mention what's not yet accommodated by this data model, because as you saw, there was just a, a few size metrics. Maybe you care about shape or opacity, other types of metrics. And also, the, the data model does not explicitly include uncertainty. I do want to say it was talked about a lot, but ultimately, the data table it was determined to just provide those data that you're certain of in the table. And an example might be, um, let's say your automated classifier has given you this label all the way down to a species level. But when you contribute the data to OBIS, uh, you know, you might make a decision to provide the data at genus level, right? Because you're not as confident with the species level identification. So what's coming up, um, at least for me, I'm excited for going to this marine data um, marine biodata mobilization workshop and some others on the call here today are uh, also signed up for this workshop. And my goal is to create a demo notebook that transforms from this uh, working groups data model, includes those additional fields that were needed to get the data into OBIS and um, outputs the Darwin Core archive like Diana was showing with the three tables. Actually, you might even have four tables with yours, Diana. I think mine will end up with three. <laughs> There are there, although the OCB working group has concluded its work, there's today a European working group that one of their objectives is to further standardize data from imaging system or plankton imaging systems. And so some of you might be on the call today and I'll be interested in, in uh, conversing later with you, seeing what, what else is going on to follow on to the work that we did before. And so finally, I just want to thank uh, this particular project um, today is funded by the NOAA PCM HAB program and other work funded by NSF and HUI. And I'm, I'm thinking not only the working group, but the three repositories I highlighted today and Heidi Sossick's lab group and our uh, NOAA collaborators.
Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stace. That was fantastic. Uh, it looks like there was one question in the chat is, uh, can this impressive classification of micro stuff in a volume of water be used to monitor for an intrusion of microplastics? And maybe that, that could be a longer discussion as well. So my first response would be depending on the imaging system and the size of the microplastic, right? So the imaging system I focused on today, the, the IFCB, it's really good in a size range of about 10 to 100 microns. So I would just need to talk with Rob about the size range that they're interested in because there's other instruments that would do um, less than 10 microns in, in a better in a better way. And in terms of what would you call a microplastic, even in the sea bass vocabulary, there is an example being um, we have bead, right? Because these instruments are calibrated using beads, which for all I know might actually be very analogous to a microplastic. And so um, I, I imagine, yeah, they could be used. Gotcha. Well, thank you so much, Stace. I really appreciate Thanks. it. Uh, so our next presentation um, is on the Marine Ecological Time Series Research Coordination Network, and that'll be a, a joint presentation with Heather Benway from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and Fernando Pacheco from the University of Hawaii. So I think, Heather, you'll be kicking us off. And I can you see You all slides. see that? Excellent. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Heather Benway and I manage the Ocean Carbon and Biogeochemistry OCB project office, which is hosted by Woods Hole Oceanographic. So I'm here with Stace today in the snow, slushy, snowy rain. And uh, we received funding from NSF and NASA. Today, I was invited to introduce you to a new NSF Earth Cube funded activity called the Marine Ecological Time Series Research Coordination Network, which I will from here out referred to as the METS RCN. Um, sustained ship-based ocean time series programs have long been a cornerstone of oceanographic research, but there is really still a lack of METS data and metadata reporting standards. And when you combine that with a whole lot of disconnected data management efforts, it really makes it difficult for users to access these really valuable and unique data sets. So when I talk about time series, marine ecological time series, I'm referring to ship-based time series programs all over the world. For the many of the biogeochemical and biological parameters measured by ship-based time series, there really aren't any community adopted data or metadata reporting standards. So I, I just wanted to give you a sense of the, the types of variables I'm talking about here. Um, and I'd also like to provide a little historical context um, from the OCB perspective anyway, there's really, there's a long history of international coordination. You can see a lot of our, our partners here, um, coordination and community building and support of ship-based ocean time series programs. Today, I really wanna focus on these, these recent efforts and activities highlighted in orange since they have helped catalyze the RCN that we have today. So in 2018, 2019, um, I co-authored a decadal vision paper for ocean time series programs as a community white paper submission to the Frontiers Special Volume for the Ocean OBS 19 meeting. I've distilled the key messages, messages of this paper here with those in bold really being the most relevant to this RCN. Um, it's really important to note that at the center of all of the challenges uh, for for ocean time series really it lies data. Um, fair data solutions are really essential to support any aspect of our decadal time series vision. So that's really what, what uh, caused us to pursue the next effort. Um, you can access my slides and there's the DOI so that you can get to the frontiers paper that's referenced here. Um, so, NSF EarthCube actually provided some funds in September of 2019 for a small uh, workshop to conduct basically a gap analysis for ship-based ocean time series data cyber infrastructure and provide a forum for discussing these key issues and barriers surrounding data discovery, access, interoperability. Uh, we adopted the FAIR guiding principles to frame these issues, and you can see some of our major discussion topics highlighted here. 
Key recommendations that emerged from the workshop are also listed here, and you can access the full report via the DOI listed on the slide. But from this point forward, I really wanna focus on the item highlighted in yellow, which was one of the key recommendations. You know, We spent two and a half days together really identifying what the key challenges are and, and talking about potential solutions. And we determined that we needed a longer term effort that would really involve more of the community in these discussions, um, an international discussion, not just a US discussion, to build some consensus on fair data solutions for these time series programs. So, as a direct outgrowth of this workshop, I submitted a proposal with co PIs Danny Kincaid from the Bico Demo and Angelique White from University of Hawaii, who is also the lead PI of the Hawaii Ocean Time Series Program, uh, for an EarthCube funded research coordination network to kind of extend these important cyber infrastructure discussions to the broader community of data scientists and managers. METS data producers and users and representatives of complementary ocean observing programs because there's certainly a lot of insight to be gained by what's already been done. The METS RCN has the following overarching objectives. Uh, we want to bring together members of the ocean science, data science, and informatic communities to build consensus on key components of a fair data model for METS, including common vocabularies, metadata reporting standards, and data citation practices. We want to engage broader METS data users. We want it to, to really maximize our, the return on investment in the collection of these data sets. We feel that you know, making them more accessible, not just to the scientific community, um, but also educators, decision makers, there's really a lot of potential for these data sets. And finally, we really wanted to focus on building community capacity for METS data analysis to statistical methods and data model integration, including the ingestion, analysis, and integration of METS data with other disciplinary and cross-disciplinary data to accelerate science, scientific discovery. So we got funding. Um, the METS RCN really leverages the ocean coordination and community building experience and staff capacity of the, uh, the OCB office, which I oversee, and the infrastructure expertise and extensive METS data handling experience of, of Bico Demo. Um, we are currently in the first phase of the RCN, which has largely been about establishing leadership and spreading the word throughout the oceanographic community via a web presence and a town hall meeting at Ocean, Science, Ocean Sciences, which we just found out was accepted before the holidays. We've assembled the leadership for the RCN, including a steering committee to provide oversight of all RCN activities and um, a METS data working group to oversee development of key components of a fair data model. This includes aligning with existing vocabularies, metadata reporting, data citation, things I've already mentioned. Um, these two leadership bodies comprise expertise in oceanography, data science, statistics, earth system models, informatics, membership spanning a mix of large and small US and international ship-based time series programs and data repositories. Um, and a few of our members are actually in our session today, which I was really excited to see. Uh, we also now have a web presence and our town hall proposal was accepted. So we we're planning a town hall meeting and I'll include information about that on the last slide. We really wanna use that to launch the RCN and get the word out to the broader community. Um, over the next six to 12 months, the METS data working group will be developing pilot data workflows and use, use cases for testing and feedback by a range of METS data users as part of a larger consensus building activity. We wanted to have this in year one, COVID had other plans. Um, we're, we're depending on what happens with COVID, it could be end up being a virtual activity, but we will eventually do a broader consensus building exercise. Um, the METS data working group members have been discussing semantic approaches and are working on their first use case, which is going to start with very rudimentary, you're going to laugh, parameters uh, fo focused on time and space, which you'd be surprised at the range of reporting that, that we see. Um, but we wanted to start with the very basic things that are common to all time series. Um, and working to develop a common set of standards for time series programs will be aligning 
with existing vocabularies whenever possible. We're not out to reinvent any wheels. Our goal is really to get the time series community together to adopt a common set of standards for reporting for a core set of biogeochemical and biological parameters, just so that we can make these data sets more comparable and support larger scientific and synthetic efforts across time series. So finally, the, the next phase of the RCN will focus on broadening uh, METS data user communities. This will involve developing a pilot regional METS user networks around a small subset of well-established time series to build and strengthen links to interested scientists, um, including observationalists, modelers, also resource managers, um, educators. We're going to initiate this work virtually. And then as the user networks start to take form, we'll convene a workshop to discuss the distinct information needs of different users and brainstorm on data formats, user interfaces, anything we can do to better meet those needs and get more value from these time series programs. And we really envision that these small regional user networks, these, these initial activities will help inform future stakeholder engagement in regional observing programs. Um, finally, we are going to focus on building METS data analysis capacity. This is an important challenge and this is an opportunity to enhance the impact of these data sets. We need to build capacity for analysis and synthesis across METS and with complementary multi-platform and observations to address spatial patterns of variability and change. Um, the RCN's development of a fair data model framework will be absolutely critical um, to, to support these efforts. And we're hoping to um, convene a hackathon. Um, we'll build capacity in foster, and foster hands-on instruction, peer learning, collaboration, um, building new partnerships. Uh, we're going to do this hackathon in an Ocean Hack Week format. We've had conversations with the Ocean Hack Week folks, and that's, we think, is a nice high pro profile way to do this. Um, potential modules might include statistics, visualization, METS data for modelers, computational methods to support data integration across shipboard autonomous and satellite remote sensing platforms. Really, the sky's the limit, but first, we really have to, to establish some fair reporting standards. Um, my last slide, learn more. Come to the new website. Um, there are a lot of ways to get involved. We have an email list. We are setting up a Slack workspace. And once again, there will be a town hall meeting on Thursday the 24th at 3 p.m. Eastern. So we hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. That was fantastic. Great to learn about that uh, that project. That's awesome. Uh, there was one question in the chat on, uh, do you plan to archive the guidelines you'll be developing in the Ocean Best Practices system? And I, I'm pretty sure that's a yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I am in regular contact with the Ocean Best Practices folks, and, and we I'm always trying to funnel as much to there as possible. I think that's a, a really important piece of infrastructure for the ocean community. That's fantastic to hear. All right, well, thank you, Heather. Um, we'll pivot over to Fernando um, from the University of Hawaii. Fernando, take it away and I can see your screen. You'd, you might be hearing me right now, yeah? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, uh, we can hear you. Yeah, thanks, Heather. That was a great introduction to Matt's RCN. Um, so my name is Fernando. I work for the Hawaiian Ocean Time Series Program here at the University of Hawaii at Manua. And my role here is to help the program with uh, data collection, data processing, data release of all uh, some of biogeochemical and physical parameters that we collect here on a monthly basis with our uh, research vessel, Kilamuana. And today I would like to share you a task that I've been working on since last year, which is related to the standardization of some variable names. Believe it or not, we're still missing some um, standard names out there on BicoDemo, uh, sorry, uh, BODC or CBAS platform or CF uh, climate and forecast metadata conventions. So that's what I'm gonna present to you today. So this is 
uh, this slide is just a sample of all the parameters that we have at BETS, uh, at HOT, sorry, I used to work for BETS as well. So from our original data set, used should be 69 variables, um, biogeochemical parameters. We do have much more when you include underway data, met, uh, uh, meteorological observations. So this is just a snapshot of all the variables around with our own uh, variable name. So when you look to other projects, I just put on the right side, what about other progress and projects? Imagine how many variable names out there with um, different uh, units, different um, descriptions. So let's say you wanna compare a data set or just a variable, let's say just a variable from Atlantic with the Pacific and uh, one, one group will call chlorophyll A, the other one will call pig 14 uh, chlorophyll A, but what that, that means, um, are they talking about the same chlorophyll? Is that the same uh, unit? So that's where we're trying to not solve, but try to help the community find in this um, standard vocabulary. So when we talk about hot data, only the Hawaiian Ocean time series data, we have four dif different platforms out there. You can download our data from HOT website, Ocean Science, Picodemo, and CCHDO right now. Um, again, believe it or not, even those these platforms, they present our data in a slightly different way. They should be exactly all the same, right? But sometimes they will not present the same uh, short name or long name or descriptions. But that's, again, that's one thing that we're trying to promote and uh, standardize the names. So we have been, we have been submitting our data to ocean sites uh, and they follow the rules from CF, the Climate and Forecast Met Metadata Convention. Um, so for example, let's say from our uh, dissolved inorganic carbon, you have a short name DIC with this unit on climate forecast standard name vocabulary, that would be mall concentration of dissolved inorganic carbon in seawater. They have their own unit in canonical units and a very generic description for this kind of variable. And um, right now, uh, CF has about 23 variables that we can use for, for the HOT program. But again, is still missing that are still missing. Uh, we still we're still missing some variables, so we try to propose new standard names to this CF community, mainly because we have been submitted the data to Ocean Science. Um, next one, and the way we did this, it was following the rules from two communities, CF and BODC, mainly because they are the, I can, could say the biggest ones uh, from uh, Ocean Science community. Um, so basically, they have their own rules and grammar uh, protocols. BODC has their, their semantic. So we try to combine a little bit of each community and build uh, and proposal the standard name to CF. As I said, CF, it's more generic. BODC likes to be more specific about um, the data. Uh, but and both of them can be found on NERC vocabulary server. Um, so yeah, the way you create or the way you propose a new standard name for CF, you just start following their rule. You have a grammar and uh, you, you literally follow their conventions. This is just an example for you to, if you want to discuss more about that. Uh, BODC, they have a different, slightly way to create a variable. So they have a long name which is made by the concatenation of concepts. And each concept has a collection you can play around with. Uh, for example, you're gonna have concentration of chlorophyll A per unit volume of water body. And um, you can see that they specify the, that the particulate needs to be higher than a GFF filter and the method is a filtration. So they like to be very specific. So there are some uh, problems when you try to uh, create a variable on CF community. Um, so next one, last, last slide. So that's what we've been trying to do. Um, we, we submitted 44 new standard names to the CF community in two sets of batches. 
um, the discussion is still going. If you want to help us to review the descriptions, to suggest new terms, uh, please, you are um, more than welcome to help us. Um, this is not perfect solution, but it's a beginning uh, to put all the groups to communicate and uh, try to present the same kind of variable on a platform so people can have a better way to analyze the data set. It's going to be more interoperable between the community. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Fernando. Um, I actually have a one, one question for you in, in going through that process of submitting a, a batch of standard names to the, the CF GitHub. How, have you been able to get scientists and PIs involved in that process? And, and if so, has it has it been difficult to try to sell them on using technologies like GitHub to try to communicate and, and move that forward in more of an open process instead of you know, through emails or things like that? Um, yeah, great question. It's been very difficult, to be honest. Um, <laughs> mainly because, um, yeah, you have GitHub new technology, so not everyone wants to start using it. Uh, other people really want to use it, but th yeah, there's a debate between that. But also, uh, it's really hard to submit or to propose a new variable name when you are not a specialist so you need to put people together and have an agreement on the definition so this is this is really hard um so i believe that what we did it, it, it was not perfect but it's just a start point that people can say oh oh this is wrong so okay tell me what's wrong and we can work together and make this better so that's that's an approach that we hope that other groups uh, can can help us as well. Fantastic! Yeah, thank thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Fernando. Um, I think we can uh, we'll move on to uh, our last presenter, Sean Smith from Florida State University who will be talking about the SAMOS metadata exchange. And SAMOS is a shipboard automated meteorological and oceanographic system. So Sean, take it away. Ready. Thank you. Can you all see that window? Yeah, it looks good. If you could, they're perfect. Okay, in the presenter mode here, and we'll see how this goes. So this actually, uh, the previous talk was really a good lead in to this one, because again, we're dealing, I'm going to be presenting on down in the weeds a little bit into the metadata world, but for underway research vessel data. So this is the complement to those, those time series data sets you were just talking about. These are the data collected by the ships when they're going from point A to point B. Um, so that's uh, what SAMOS has been doing now for, oh, going on, you know, we, we started back in 2005. So this is just a little overview of the SAMOS initiative. What we've been doing for uh, since 2005 is we have been collecting underway meteorological and oceanographic data from ships, uh, including their navigational data as well. Um, and the data has been collected from primarily US operated vessels. That's why you can see in this, this data density plot, which I really need to update. It's, uh, it's, it's been a few years, lots of data around North America. Uh, that's where the observations are the heaviest. Uh, but we also have good contributions from around Hawaii because uh, the, uh, the Hawaii uh, Kilo Moana is one of our ships. And over there by Bermuda, because we have the Atlantic Explorer is another one of the ships that sends data to us. Uh, we also have a partnership with the Australian IMOS program. So we get data from the Australian and New Zealand vessels. Uh, so that's why you see good coverage down in the, in the Southern Ocean around those countries as well. But the data we're dealing with is a high temporal resolution. So we're getting one minute interval observations from these ships. Uh, with this basic global coverage we're shooting for. Our user community is um, not real time. We're not doing this for the folks that are interested in operational weather forecasting or ocean forecasting. Our data is slightly delayed mode. We get the data every day from the ship, but the user community are those folks doing things like 
algorithm development for satellites. They want to be able to validate a new satellite retrieval algorithm, or you want to validate a numerical model, an ocean model, or an atmospheric model. This high resolution data is uh, what they're interested in for those activities. So what exactly do we manage? Again, I mentioned we're meteorology and oceanography from research ships. Uh, this photograph here is actually the bow mast from the uh, Neil Armstrong. Uh, they have two weather sensors on the mast that measure temperature, humidity, pressure, uh, um, winds, and rainfall. They also have uh, radiometers out here for shortwave and longwave, as well as uh, photosynthetic radiation. And that's pretty much the common suite of measurements we're getting from most of the ships. We also get the data from their underway uh, thermosalinograph. So we're getting uh, sea temperature and salinity data from er almost every ship that's participating in, in the program. Part of what I want to talk about today, and I'll get back to it a little bit, is potential additions to the data stream that we have. Um, most of these ships carry uh, high resolution navigation systems for pitch, roll, and heave. Uh, newer, newer ships that are coming out, the regional class research vessels in the US, are going to be equipped with present weather sensors, celiometers, and the ability to measure waves and swell in an automated way. And most ships carry a much more uh, detailed flow water system than just measuring temperature and salinity. They can measure a wide range of the, the biological and chemical observations. But what I really wanted to focus on in this talk is all the information you need to know about this data in order to actually use it. And so one of the things SAMUS has been doing since its inception is collecting a very detailed set of metadata for both the ship and every instrument and device on board the ship. So this is just an example from our, you know, our screen from our database uh, tool that shows for a single sea temperature from a single ship, all the in information we collect about the, the observations. We're capturing units, we're capturing instrument make model, serial number, calibration information. Um, and very important, we're capturing information on where that sensor is located but also in the case of a flow water system, where is the intake located? Where does the water come from that actually goes into that? And we even have started collecting a pipe run distance so we know how far that water's traveled through the ship. Uh, we're very much interested in all the information on whether the data is averaged or spot instantaneous value. And the sampling rates and data precision really play a role in uh, the use of the data. So you can only imagine the challenge of keeping this information up to date. Meteorological and oceanographic sensors on ships, it's not like uh, putting a multi-beam on the ship where they put it in the ship and it's there for you know, years or maybe even a decade. These sensors change monthly, maybe more frequent. It's very common for these sensors to change a lot during a year. And so the only way we currently know that they change something is they tell us. Uh, we get an email from the operator, they send us a new metadata form, so this is, it's been working, but yeah, things aren't always up to date when you do it this way. So the new vision that we've been working on in the past few years is to automate the metadata exchange as well as the data exchange. So now, because all these ships carry computerized data acquisition systems, what we're focusing on is having the technicians enter that information once on board the ship in the data acquisition system. And then the acquisition system actually sends that information to us or any other user that wants it. So we couldn't go to an ESIP meeting and not show a you know, screen with a bunch of teeny tiny XML um, and certainly not expecting you to read this. Um, but what we actually been working on is creating a metadata exchange format, an XML format for sensor device information and ship information. Um, and so this is just an example of, of a, a, a beta of this XML we're working on. But the idea is everything you saw in that metadata table for every variable is now being keyed in an XML format. Um, and that XML is actually developed by the acquisition system on board the ship. Um, so currently we have two adopters of this. Uh, Oregon State University has their Coriolis data management system that they've uh, built this into. 
And for those of you from NOAA that have been out on ships, you might be familiar with the scientific computing system, the SCS software that, that the NOAA ships run. And this is actually now available in version five of that system that's being rolled out. So what happens with this new way of doing things is once the technician enters it into the, the, the system on board the ship, when we get our data every day, we also get a corresponding metadata XML for that day uh, in the same email package. Then our software here uh, at our data center can actually look at that, parse it out, and look for changes. We can basically you know, see what we had yesterday, see what came in today, and we know when something's changed uh, as soon as it changes. The nice, the, the hope is that this will uh, improve our accuracy of the metadata and that they're up to date. And I guess the big question that we always ask is why do we care about this? And this is in the ESIP community, we all pretty much can answer this question, but this is just an example of an interoperability activity where metadata plays the key. Uh, this is a NASA funded project uh, through the NASA Access Program. Uh, it's for developing a cloud-based data matchup service. The idea is that you have a bunch of satellite data sitting at NASA Podak, and then you have in situ data from Saildrome, from Samos, uh, a big uh, product made by NOAA and NCAR called ICOADS, and then you have various field experiments like SPURS and some of these things. Well, they all produce data for things that people want to co-locate. I want to be able to match my satellite sea temperature data to a bunch of in situ data from ships, buoys, whatever. Doing this is you know, very labor intensive. Most people have to download those data sets to, one, to their, their server locally and do all this work themselves. This is an approach to actually make an open source cloud-based tool that allows people to do this matchup on the fly with custom uh, thresholds and tolerances. But the only way that this works is you have to somehow get these different data sets to talk to each other uh, because everybody calls sea surface temperature something different in these different data sets. Um, so the very first part of the effort of this CDMS project, we spent the first few months actually trying to standardize these different data sets to common vocabularies. And so these are some of the vocabularies that we have been using in, in this process. So just to take a step forward, one of the things that I was asked to do here is talk a little bit about a new frontier and where can the marine data cluster and the biological community come together to, to, to think about working together on some new things. One of the things that Samos has been thinking about doing for probably a decade, we just haven't had the time to do it, is expanding the data that we collect on a regular basis to include all those measurements made by a flow water system on board a ship. Um, and this is the water wall from the Atlantic Explorer uh, in their science lab. So you can see that they have you know, a PCO2 system, they have the ability to do pH, they have multiple TSGs, fluorometers, transmissometers. All these data can actually be sent to SAMOS. The problem is I'm a marine meteorologist. I don't know much about you know, these data sets. I don't know what the biological parameters are they measure, what their thresholds should be, you know, any of the things we need to do to be able to monitor and quality control them. So I need input from the technical experts in a completely different community to make this work. We also have to start thinking about things about, you know, think or thinking about terms for instruments like flow meters. It's very important to document a flow meter and, I, and document the flow rate. I've learned this through the years in the SAMOS project, but when I went to look up flow rate in a control vocabulary, no such thing, doesn't exist. Flow meter, forget about it. They don't have any knowledge of these in any of the existing vo vocabularies. So there's a lot of work to be done for that. So just as a few food for thought discussion topics, really my interest is how do we engage the biochemistry and the biogeochemistry community? Um, you know, how do we get the information we need to start bringing these, these other uh, devices into the SAMOS system? Vocabularies, it's still a question, you know, 
what one do you use and what granularity? I actually was involved in a marine data cluster session on this uh, a while back. Um, and during just the talks today, I heard about, oh, there's some some uh, vocabularies I think I need to look at, you know, from these communities for the for the biological side. And then even standards of, you know, where is a device on a platform? Are there good vocabularies for how you document, you know, where something is on a platform? You know, this would be very useful. So, and expanding on this XML idea, obviously this was developed with a specific program in mind, meteorology and flow water systems. But um, if it's got some potential to be expanded beyond that and standardized for, for a broader community, we'd be very interested in contributing to that. Just take a quick moment to put up the giant text that is all my funding stuff, uh, but basically to acknowledge uh, NOAA National Science Foundation and the Schmidt Ocean Institute, who are the primary funders of the SAMOS project. At that point, I'll take questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sean. I, I think that that inspired a lot of conversation. Um, I think that the first, along with the your one of your last statements is, um, you know, mapping the um, SAMOS metadata format, can can that be mapped into the sensor ML? Or do you know about sensor ML? I guess I am familiar with sensor ML, but not the, but certainly not in the down the weeds level. I, I've heard of it, but I, we've not actually gone into that. I, I will admit right off the bat that even our XML you know, schema that we're working on hasn't really been schematized you know what i mean we haven't we haven't gone through the level of making sure it's it's perfectly conformant yet you know so that's that's one of those tasks we really need to do right right gotcha um and then one more question was uh from rob casey on what are your feelings regarding generating a fit for purpose xml schema from whole cloth versus adopting a generic standard xml schema example sensor ml Gonna say, I guess I don't quite understand all the details on that, but um, you know, I, I certainly would be interested in discussing any options where we can come up with a way to make this metadata exchange programmatic. That's really the whole idea behind it. Um, the way we're we're developing it is kind of a ground grassroots, ground up approach. We're working with the developers of the acquisition systems and ourselves who understand what the terminology is we want. Um, but again, we're working from the bottom up to create this. Maybe we need to, you know, years ago, I attended, you know, Anna's sessions on ISO metadata. Uh, you know, I took those classes and, you know, I look at something like the ISO schema and I go, mm, that might be too big for what we're dealing with here. You want it to be something you can drop, you can exchange over a satellite network. Uh, so, you know, we do have to think about, you know, size and those kind of things. But yeah, definitely kind of be interested in talking. Cool. Sounds like some collaboration, maybe. Um, so I just want to say thank you, first off, to all the presenters. I really appreciate everybody coming in and um, and giving their, their lightning talks. That was all fantastic information. Um, and so now what I'd like to do is just open the floor to, to open discussion. Feel free to unmute yourself, raise your hand, put something in the chat. Um, and, you know, I really want this to be an, an open area where we can facilitate collaboration and cross pollinating. There's a lot of talk about metadata, a lot of talk about standard names. So where are things that we can help each other out? Where, where, how, what can we do next to, to keep this community moving forward and, and um, engaging with each other? So I'll, I'll, I'll open it up if, um, if anybody feels like hopping in. Hey, Matt, I had a question in the chat that hasn't been answered yet. So I was hoping to maybe touch on that one. Yeah, yeah, go for it, Abby. Yeah, I was just curious if the Mets RCN is planning uh, for to submit to OBIS as one of the places where the data might end up, um, like Carico has done. That's a great question. Um, I think that so that right now, the way that the time series data are submitted, they're the, the two big NSF time series, which um, are bats and hot, as most of you are familiar, are go through go to Bico Demo. Um, that's what they're mandated to do. But um, I think that, you know, once what I would like to do is have there be some 
interoperability so that they can be accessed from any of these other uh, data repositories. Um, there are other US time series that are accessible from you know, NOAA and, and NASA databases. It's just a matter of figuring out how to be able to work across these these data repositories to access these, or you know, whether it's pointing to a data data repository if it's not the primary data repository, or whatever is needed to ensure that you can get these data mirrored in other places. Where we're also working with international time series, and there are that's even more complex in terms. Some of them don't even share data, some of them are sharing them from their website, some of them are going through um, European led databases. So it's just a matter of identifying the best approach. All right. Um, I see there's there's some other chat um, about it looks like <laughs> we're getting into atomic metadata, um, which almost sounds like a, a cartoon show my son was watching or something. Um, I can chime in on that um, the point that we were yeah. trying to. So, you know, we see this in the Helmholtz ecosystem too. You know, we have scientists and PIs who, who are not going to do this, like the metadata formats, adopting certain grammars that are conceptually also quite complex and also involve a bunch of commitments to a certain model that like they have stuff to do on the ground. So what we say, okay, we recognize that reality. Um, we then recommend try to gather the data. This is with a couple of projects that we're funding with uh, some of our institutes. Gather the data as atomically as possible, meaning, you know, get the value separately from the unit. Make sure that, you know, the unit is expressed in writing or an abbreviation that's coming from SI or something. Um, and just really separate it down. And very similar to what we saw with the, the Samos presentation, you know, get really granular with it because you never know what, how, what system you want, want to or need to submit to in the future, five years down the line, two years down the line, or what you want to do with that data. And then like the ERDAP logic that was brought up a couple of times, once you have that locally, you can cast that data out into any kind of format that you need. So Darwin Core to go to OBIS, if you want to do the international thing and participate in IOC, UNESCO, Ocean Decade stuff, or you can uh, cast it to something like ISO if you need to submit to one of your, uh, so like the US federal systems, you know? So I think that's the key. We have to be able to massage it frequently, for sure get familiar with it, but then give that to the data scientists or data engineers to say, here's a bunch of atomic data. Um, here are the systems we need to interact with. Can you create now the converters to project that data out in forms that can be ingested? That maps to the semantics and things, you know? So I think that's, that's the, the essence of that conversation. Uh, Margaret, what do you think about uh, is that is that your, what you're agreeing with, or do you have a perspective? I I totally agree with you. I also think it applies to the data, not just the metadata. That constraining a format at the beginning, um, the way some systems do, I mean, it's really valuable to have distributors like Obis because you can query across vast amounts of data really quickly. But sometimes the original data needs to be in a different format than than this distributor format simply because of its complexity and that's actually really important to have both those versions so you can always go back to the original version and transform it however it needs to be done mm -hmm. yeah, now are, oh, sorry. i was just gonna say are, are there examples of this out in the wild or is this all <laughs> still kind of theoretical conversations that, that no. happen oh gosh if i wasn't here i'd be working on it we, we... <laughs> Let me get back to you. We actually are trying to do this with a lot of the um, with we have, I don't know, 70 or 80 data sets now in EDI that we're trying to transform into an intermediate format and then into Darwin Core for GBIF. And I, I swear, I'm, I keep saying it'll be done by the end of X. And we are pretty close. We're just working out some details because we're doing this on a large scale. We have to make these kind of generic decisions about which data sets, what's the format we can use, and what does the scripting language work. But we're using a workflow. Basically, we start from the canonical data set, transform it to an intermediate, and then go from the intermediate to um, to Obis. But soon, I promise. <laughs> 
I'm Abby, sure, Dave. I've been talking about this to Abby for ages. <laughs> Similar, similar case out. with similar case with some of our so at the Alfred Wegener Institute, one of the Helmholtz Institutes, we did this. We set it up for one of our uh, time series groups actually uh, in the in in the polar regions uh, for genomic data, and we said, all right, let's just scope out what kind of data you're collecting. And we have an internal simple SQL database that they that the scientists can fill in with a form, and we're converting all of the data that's in like Excel data sets or data sheets. I don't know what you call them. I, I stay away from Excel as much as I can. Um, so we're converting that into that system so it's all sort of regularized and normalized. And uh, we just hired a couple of student assistants who were talented at coding to script um, exports into like mix compliance for INSDC submission, et cetera. And we're working on a Darwin core export too. That, you know, um, came into the Helmholtz metadata collaboration, which is like a trans institute thing that we work with to scale it up. And now we're, we have a project co-funded by Helmholtz Central to scale that to another Helmholtz Institute, Geomar, that does ocean research. And then we're hoping that that model then just allows us to wrangle all the data internally within Helmholtz to a state that we can just project it out. Like, okay, if a US system needs it, sure, give us your specifications. Um, we can write the script and the data is safe for posterity and easily massageable in various ways. We're just careful not to um, preload uh, or like prematurely commit to a certain model that will lock us in later because we just never know what's coming. Right. So, and, and that's the, that's the difficult part. I mean, what we've discovered in our, we do actually, we just finished a paper about the first step, the harmonization, but there always are, there's, it's, I don't think we have a single data set that has been lossless in doing the conversion from the, from the authoritative version to the harmonized version. There is always, almost always some details that there simply isn't a spot for in this harmonization process. There may be some that are, that are lossless, but I, that's, I'd have to go, we have to go back and analyze that. Do you have a, um, is there an example, Pierre, for that system? I mean, it's mostly internal now, but again, with that's that project that's scaling it up is is starting up, and that's when we're going to help them uh, write out their documentation, et cetera. So it's not there yet, but as Rob mentions in the chat, it would be happy after like perhaps next winter meeting when that project has warmed up a little bit, um, January meeting. Sorry for the Australians. Um, it, when that warms up a bit, I, I think we'd be in a state to present what we're up to. Yeah. Nothing secret. Nothing secret. You know. So I'm pretty sure that the PIs of that project would be willing to share what we're up to. It's it's really it's not it's not that complex and intentionally so because it should be um, just simple storing of the data in in atomic form and then being able to script out whatever we need. So um, yeah, we'll get back to you. And this also fits into some of the work we talked about in Abby's session. You know, biological data standards. We're trying to make sure that there's a mapping across like Mix, Darwin Core, and others, so we don't have to sort of so that those standards are also aligning in the background. So then the users don't have to choose because they're already doing mapping work, but you know, that's gonna take some doing. Um, in the meantime, we can just preserve the data uh, and the semantic layer on top of that as, in a, as granular as atomic way as we can. <clears throat> so yeah, Rob, if there's something to report on that, I, I, you know, we can probably bring that up during the marine data cluster meetings uh, during the year. <clears throat> Steve, you politely have your hand raised. So formal. I've been in a lot of Zoom meetings this morning. It's been beaten into me. Uh, so at the risk of just like flipping over tables and stuff, <clears throat> which I want to do, I think that there are other people like Heather who would look at the discussions that we have. We trend toward the very technical that should lead to discovery and broad interoperability. But I think that that's not, it's still not true. For all of our efforts, I think there's a lot of users out there that can't find the data they're looking for. Once they find them, they don't really know what to do with them. And I am getting to the point of when are we going to have a sort of a two-sided discussions at both ends of the food chain? One is the day-to-day -day ocean, ocean data user who just wants to go point me to a website. Don't tell me how easy it is to use. Let me figure it out for myself. And on the other side, getting to the funders, and I think that the, our European colleagues have a better situation that their funders are more aligned with realistic things and adequate funding, um, where we can get NSF, NOAA, USGS, and others to fund things that are actually going to be robust and effective discovery systems for oceanographic data users and, and, and climate system modelers. 
I mean, please disagree with me. If I have, if what I have said is not true, please say you're completely wet, no pun intended. And, um, and, and that was a waste of my 10 seconds. I'll never get back. Hey, Steve, this is, this is Sean. I, I agree with you completely. I think, you know, absolutely there's a need to get to the point where the data is available in the ways that users the users that want it can uh, can get to it and and understand it is more important you know they have to be able to understand what's there i think that you know, you brought that up in one of the talks you did yesterday you know just because the water data is there in flint doesn't mean the people that need it have any idea what it means go for it heather Thanks, Steve, for bringing this up. I just wanted to say, just on behalf of the ocean scientists who are out there collecting these data, especially for these time series programs, um, I can speak in particular on for bats and hot. Um, there's not a whole lot of money that goes in to support the, the data provision part of this. These people are working on a shoestring and they have, they don't have funding to sit down and make sure that they format their data sets and submit them to all of the different repositories. And from in the case of HOT, um, Fernando showed some showed a data set at the beginning there of his presentation. HOT data go to all of these different places. And the whole idea here, at least in my mind, is to make sure they submit them to one place and everybody else can point to that original source so that there aren't multiple versions of these data sets going all over the place. And really the, the PIs and the, the, the data folks in these, at these sites, just they don't have time to do this. They don't have time to format these data sets for eight different repositories. So you know maybe tools like ERDAP or, or, or whatever, I'm an oceanographer, sorry, I'm really not a data scientist, but you know, I feel very passionately that, you know, that I agree with Steve that the US needs to step up and fund some of this very important effort to make sure that these data sets are, are preserved and are accessible, are broadly accessible in a timely manner. And that requires investment. That doesn't just happen. But sometimes we shoot ourselves, you know, in, in our own feet and trip over our own shoelaces, whatever metaphor you want to use, because the very people who are program managers at NSF no NS. And USGS are the, you know, used to be seagoing scientists who will listen to the community say something like, well, if you put all this money into data systems, that's one less cruise or, you know, less observations. I mean, think about, think about BGC or uh, is it go BGC or BGC Argo? I can't remember, but which one is throwing 500, not throwing, throwing, <clears throat> gently lowering 500 floats into the water. And there's not a dime for data management. So we're stuffing the pipe with all new <clears throat> parameters, BGC, um, you know, ecosystem dynamics, people are going crazy. And we go, well, how are we gonna manage the data? And that entire grant, $50 million has no data management. So we do it to ourselves. We're signaling, we acquiesce and signal that this isn't, it, it, I wanna get the instruments in the water and I'll kick this can down the road. So I think it's a problem the upside of that, the optimism comes from, we can solve this problem. We can go to our program managers and say, reallocate funds. We, we can do that. That's been done before. That's how GoShip happened. That's how Argo happened. That's how many of these observing systems happen that cause multi-million dollars is that a significant number of scientists go to the program manager and says, you know, give us money to do this. And we have seen, you know, what Argo has more profiles than, every other ob observing system from all time. So these things can be done. Um, I think that it's just a matter of will, really. We have the technology, we have knowledgeable people in this cluster. I think there's reason for optimism is just, uh, will we take action? And, and will we talk to our users directly in spite of what we may want as data managers, what they need right now? Thank you, Steve. I'll never be invited back. I know. 
<laughs> you are officially discontinued from the marine data cluster. No, um, that no, that that that's a great conversation. Um, and you know, I, obviously, there's nothing we can you know take action on it now. But I I think that's where, hopefully, you know, the marine data cluster and the biological data standards cluster can kind of help build some of those resources to communicate the need and the, the requirements up to the program managers and be able to start ingraining these things further up the chain. Um, so we have five minutes left. Um, there's a lot more hands that just went up. I see Sean first and then Rob. Okay, yeah, just real quick, I, I did want to follow up a little about what Steve said, uh, related, related to the fact that there's precedence for doing exactly what he's talking about doing. Um, and what Heather brought up was really important is that, you know, the scientists are out there doing their thing and making data sets, and they don't necessarily have the time to put that into an archive or put it into a data system of any kind. But most of you probably are familiar with a project called the World Ocean Circulation Experiment. You know, the World Ocean Circulation Experiment was this huge international project that actually funded a data system. It was actually part of, they had a data management center, they had different data, you know, DACs distributed around the world. And most of those DACs had one simple philosophy about getting data, just give it to us. They didn't care what format it was in. They didn't care, you know, how it was structured. As long as you gave them the data and the metadata with them, they were funded to standardize them. They, there was a whole system in place to do that. So, you know, again, it's 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 a matter of funding will, not necessarily we can't do it. So you don't really have to put the work on the scientists. You know, you have to build a system that supports the scientists. Go for it, Rob. Thanks. It was, it was um, I don't know if it's a question or an observation, but I never did see mention of the OOI program coming up in, in these presentations. And I was wondering, because that was a big, expensive program with, you know, big uh, data management and data collection aims worked out. Couldn't they be kind of at the center of this um, kind of uh, data collective question and data management question? I'll just chime in for a moment. Hi, it's Stace from Hui. I help out with the uh, data team for the o OOI's coastal and global scale nodes. And I'm all for like, hey, I could do my next talk with the OOI data, right? I just didn't, I, you know, I didn't have time to highlight that work today. So, but um, I, I mean, I don't. I'm. I only see 25 people on my screen here. I don't notice anyone else from the data, the data team on the call, but I certainly know the others on the data team are interested in the discussion that we have here today. And I'll be sharing the slides from today. And you know, from from my perspective, sitting at NOAA at the Integrated Ocean Observing System Office, you know, data management and cyber infrastructure is a big key player that we do focus on and, and we focus on it so much that we put out to um, call for proposals on data manage DMAC um, topics to, you know, people to spend dedicated effort on what should cyber infrastructure look like over the next three years and, and what, what types of data types should we be looking at? How should we be dealing with these, you know, this eDNA or, or passive acoustic data and those types of things. So at least on, on the NOAA side, I use is looking at, you know, what what is the, the data management and cyber infrastructure that needs to be happening and, and kind of exploring what those possibilities might be. Um, but I, I can't speak on the OOI side. <laughs> All right, well, it looks like we are at time. Um, I just wanna say thank you so much to the presenters and thank you everybody for the fantastic discussion. This, this couldn't have worked out better. So thank you all, I really appreciate it and have a great rest of your day and rest of ESIP.
Thanks, Matt. Thanks, organizers and everyone here. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>